Let me now give the floor to our World Bank Acting Infrastructure Vice President, Pablo Feinsilver, who will chair and moderate the first part of this event. Over to you, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Arif, and, and hello, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. My name is Pablo Feinsilver. I am the Acting Vice President for Infrastructure at the World Bank. It is my privilege to chair this event. Uh, we will be launching a new series of publications dedicated to decarbonizing transport through investments. We call this the TDI series, Transport Decarbonization Investment Series. Uh, this series is a joint effort of the World Bank, the government of the Netherlands, and the World Resources Institute. Um, as we gear up, uh, for COP26 in November, one key objective of the organizers with this new series is to spotlight some key areas where investment and collective action are needed to decarbonize transport and to achieve global climate goals. Today's inaugural TDI session will focus on the topic of motorization management and the trade of used vehicles. This event today is also co-hosted with the UN Environment Program. Future TDI events and publications will cover other policy and investment priorities that will also be instrumental in successfully reducing the carbon footprint of the transport sector. TDI series in the future will cover various issues ranging from active mobility to green freight and logistics, urban transport and land use policies, electric mobility and charging infrastructure, and the financing of transport decarbonization across all of the above areas. So to introduce today's topic, uh, let me say a few, a few words on, on, on the issue at hand. Uh, we all know that demand for affordable motor vehicles has been growing very fast in developing countries. The number of vehicles in developing countries is, is set to double in the next two decades. So the quality of these vehicles and how they will be operated in the developing world will definitely influence the future growth of greenhouse gas emission from transport, from the road sector, but certainly with an impact on overall emissions. We all know as well that obsolete and poorly maintained vehicles are unfortunately very bad for air pollution and road safety. And this, unfortunately, is especially the case in developing countries that suffer from weak regulations and lax enforcement. We are already seeing what we are calling what, uh, a green divide between developed and developing countries when it comes to the quality of vehicle fleets and also when it comes to the outcomes of such fleets in terms of emissions, road fatalities and injuries, and local air pollution. It is therefore critical that we focus on supporting developing countries in building policies, building programs and systems to better manage motorization in ways that are consistent with both development and sustainability objectives. The other side of this agenda is the issue of trade of used vehicles. Developing countries heavily rely on importing second-hand vehicles from high-income countries. This global trade is valued at more than 18 billion per year and uh, US dollars and is expected to continue growing. As we know, um, a group of high-income countries, for now 14, have proposed to end the sale of new fossil fuel combustion engine uh, vehicles in the next decades. And this is likely to have a major impact on this trade. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is thus critical that we focus on this issue, including for that reason. At the same time, we must recognize that combustion engine, fossil fuel based vehicles are going to be with us for at least a while. There is just too much pressure for motorization, too many economic and technological challenges to imagine a scenario where electric vehicle technology alone 
will meet the global demand for mobility in the coming years. One possible scenario is that electric vehicles become rapidly dominant in the global north, while combustion engine vehicles continue to dominate for a longer period in the global south. In such a scenario, it is critical to make sure that first, the transition to zero emission vehicles can be accelerated not only in the north, but also in the global south. In fact, we will discuss this challenge in a future TDI series event. Second, our objective should be that while combustion engine vehicles continue to circulate, both in the north and in the south, such vehicles are fuel efficient and as safe as possible, wherever they are in the world. This implies raising vehicles and fuel standards, not only in the north, but also in the global south. I do hope that today's discussion will help identify some of the key interventions that we need to prioritize to take on these issues and to support a broader push for transport decarbonization. So let me introduce our uh, distinguished guests. Uh, First, I would like to give the floor uh, to Mari Pangestu, Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank. She will make a short opening statement uh, that will be followed by opening statements by our other distinguished guests. So, uh, Mary, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, uh, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's an honor to participate in this very important meeting and to, to see ag uh, again some familiar faces. I want to acknowledge in particular my fellow panelists, Min Minister van Veldhoven uh, and Executive Director Inger Andersen uh, and UNECA, U UNECA Transport Director Robert uh, Lizinge. Uh, in the last time we met at the spring meetings, we launched the new global facility for decarbonizing, decarbonizing uh, transport. And we had a really active exchange with governments, development partners, and the private sector. And I think one clear message emerged from the, that discussion. We cannot win the fight against climate change without urgently tackling emission from the transport sector. Since then, as you well know, the World Bank Group has been working on finalizing its climate change action plan 2021-2025. And in that action plan, uh, we have increased our targets for uh, climate financing to 35% uh, and identified the, the need for transformative transitions in five key systems, energy, transportation, urban infrastructure, food systems and use and manufacturing. They account for 90% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and transportation accounts for about one quarter of the energy related uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So this begs the question, if we want to move the needle on transport and climate, what are the specific actions and investments that we should prioritize? What are the policy uh, institutional strengthening and technology enablers that will actually uh, provide the conducive investment climate for these investments, transformative investments to take place? So it is very much uh, uh, in line with uh, what uh, the facility is intending to do. And I want to acknowledge and appreciate this transport decarbon decarbonization investment or TDI series, which uh, I believe will address these questions uh, and not just address them in gener generalities, but also come up with recommendations that can feed into national and global discussions for uh, investment action, as well as the changes that need uh, to happen for, for the investments uh, to, to, to occur, and obviously the financing uh, of these investments. Uh, and there are many issues, as uh, Pablo mentioned, um, uh, but today we are focusing on the quality of motor vehicles and the global trade of used vehicles uh, uh, as top of the priority list. I understand you're gonna have six, a series of six, so I really appreciate this uh, TDI series as providing uh, the platform for us to have a, a good discussion to come up with concrete uh, recommendations. On the topic of today, uh, I think uh, Pablo has already provided a very good context uh, of, of the used vehicle market uh, for developing countries that is growing and 
uh, will continue to be important, um, even though there is going to be a transition to uh, electric vehicles in developed countries. Uh, so uh, it is very important uh, that uh, we, we ensure that there is the quality vehicle that is being traded uh, to the developing countries. Uh, at the moment, roughly 90% of the four to five million used vehicles exported every year uh, go from developed countries to developing countries. And the intention is not to ban uh, used vehicle sales, but to make sure that uh, the trade uh, is only of good quality used vehicles uh, and that the importing country have the capacity to manage their vehicle fleets to avoid excess emissions, road deaths, uh, and injuries and other externalities from uh, poor uh, quality vehicles. So the point is motorization management is not just a climate imperative. It is a development issue with far reaching implications. What we do with road, uh, road vehicles not only affects uh, GHG emissions and uh, fossil fuel consumption, but also local air pollution, road safety, employment, and many other economic uh, development issues as uh, Pablo uh, has mentioned. So we hope that in this seminar uh, uh, with the paper, the discussion paper that's underlying our webinar, uh, that we can talk about the investments and policies that are needed uh, to effectively manage how used vehicles are imported, operated, maintained, and disposed once taken out of uh, circulation. So uh, we know that every country will have to uh, adjust the solution to their uh, uh, country conditions. But the key point I want to leave you with is that there is an urgent need to improve the governance of and availability of information about how motor vehicles are managed throughout their lives in developing countries. If we don't take this on, we, we likely uh, won't be able to solve the issue of transport emissions. Um, and we will transfer, transfer the problem from one part of the world to another and uh, accentuate the green divide as, as Pablo mentioned. So uh, let, me, let me end there uh, and hope that uh, really we can have a good discussion and come up with really concrete recommendations. Over to you, Pablo. Thank you so much, uh, Mary, for, for that uh, very good um, introduction. Um, let me now pass uh, the floor uh, to Minister um, Stimpte van Veldhoven, uh, Minister of Environment for the Netherlands. Uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm really honoured to speak to you today and of course delighted to be part of this discussion panel. Because there really is, and I think Mary Pangesto outlined it so clearly, there's so much to be gained from better management of motorization and trading used cars. And let me also give you some examples, not just from the climate perspective and the Green Divide, but as part of the Green Divide, the health aspect. We know that 86% of African cities suffer from poor air quality, and that Africa has the highest rate of road traffic death. And we also know that in Europe, transport-related air pollution costs us between 67 and 80 billion euros in extra healthcare, while younger, well-maintained vehicles are more energy efficient and less polluting than older, poorly maintained ones. So against this backdrop, if you look at those figures, it makes so much sense for us to join forces to improve the motorization of the management of motorization and trade in quality used cars. And I would really welcome a comprehensive assessment in that respect. But we'll have to act also decisively and smartly if we want to reap the full benefits. So what I would like to do is briefly look at the various pieces of the puzzle. Trade in used vehicles offers leapfrogging opportunities for developing countries, but leapfrog that leapfrogging is only possible uh, if we have the right policies in place because we need to ensure that only good quality used vehicles are traded. And the basic premise is actually simple. To achieve worldwide benefits, polluting and unsafe, unsafe, non-roadworthy vehicles should just be taken off the market in high income countries. There really is no point shipping them to other countries. If they are not roadworthy, they should not be on the road. But what sense does it make for them to continue to cause pollution? and make roads unsafe in developing countries. So at the same time, better motorization management and better fuel and air quality standards in developing countries are the springboards to leapfrogging. We really need to work on both sides of the chain here. So we need to take action on one, the export of vehicles 
but also on the entry of vehicles into import countries with air quality and fuel standards in mind. Only if we make the combination can we really, really make a difference. We need to look at the active use of vehicles in those countries. And of course, uh, what Mary Pangesu also mentioned, what to do with the end of life vehicles. So we believe that action is needed on two fronts. First, we need to harmonize the policies of importing and exporting countries and make them coherent. Together, we can lock that door. And second, we need to foster technical assistance and investment, of course, in developing countries. Three critical standards, export standards, enforcement and maintenance, and vehicle hand of life. The export standards, uh, many importing countries are in the process of modernizing their vehicle fleets or want to do so. For instance, I understood that the 15 West African countries in ECOWAS have jointly agreed that all imported vehicles must meet at least Euro 4 emission standard. And I really applaud that leadership because that is exactly what we need. And I'm also very pleased that we're joined by Robert Lissinge from the UN Economic Commission for Africa, who will tell us more about the vision and leadership of the African nations on this issue. But it's also up to the vehicle exporting countries in the EU. We are the world's biggest exporting hub to reflect these policies as soon as possible in our own policies on import, improving the quality of the used vehicle exports. And I'm really in favor of using a valid roadworthy certificate as a prerequisite for export. You cannot export your car unless it has a valid roadworthiness certificate. I think that is what we need. Uh, and we should also consider ways of discouraging or preventing the export of used vehicles that fail to meet Euro 4 emission standards. And I will use upcoming regulatory reform process in the EU to try and make that a reality. So second, enforcement and maintenance. We need to train vehicle inspectors in countries that have adopted policies to modernize their fleet, because that is key to better enforcement and to ensure that exports and imports are indeed in line with the Euro 4 requirements. And if they are not, the vehicles should be sent back to the countries that exported them. Motorization management and well-maintained vehicles are essential in reducing vehicle emissions, but also in improving road safety. So we'll have to find smart financial mechanisms to fund that. And lastly, we need to make the private sector part of the solution. We need to involve car makers. We need to step up extended producer responsibility. If you put something on the market, you also have responsibility for ensuring that it's well taken care of and does not pollute the environment nowhere in the world. Under current legislation, car producers share responsibility for a high recycling rate of end of life vehicles. And this is good, but in practice, it only applies in Europe. It should apply wherever in the world. So it doesn't include the many vehicles exported to low income countries when they are nearing end of life. This is a blind spot for EU countries and we need to make a change. This would also benefit the circular economy and help us with the huge challenge of ensuring that there are enough raw materials and minerals available. As wheels go round, so must materials. So to conclude, I think there are so many benefits. I could talk again for an hour. I won't, no worries. Uh, but there are so many benefits that we can achieve if we really work together. And that is why I am calling on all of you. And I'd like to present a set of recommendations at COP26 and at the UNEP fifth ministerial meeting on environment with political guidance. I think, and I hope, and I trust that the TDI series on motorization management will help us formulate those recommendations very much from an investive and innovative finance perspective, because it's the economics and the investments that we need to get right next, of course, to the regulation. I hope the TDI series will boost this and lead to smart business models and finance. But most of all, I'm looking very much forward to making a lot of speed on this topic with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister, for, for those um, encouraging words and, and for that focus on, on really achieving results. Um, let me uh, pass it now to um, another distinguished um, guest, uh, actually co-host co -host, uh, today, Inger Angers Anderson, sorry, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. And I should say a former senior manager, uh, senior leader at the World Bank. Uh, Inger, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pablo. And um, it's a pleasure to be back even if virtually in a place where I spent 15 years of my life. Uh, to Mari and to Stenje, and of course to Robert Lusingwe, who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. Thank you very, very much for, for your voices in this critical field. Look, we've heard both from Mari and from Stenje that the growth in trade of used vehicles is happening and it has to be regulated. 
and there is nearly no any there's not really any serious regulation at the global level and the global fleet on vehicles is expected to possibly triple by 2050 and 90% of that growth is going to happen in non OECD countries. And so, as we heard this green divide developed countries shifting to cleaner electric vehicles um, and the older diesel petrol, what have you goes then to the global south. Now that matters in UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, we speak about these three planetary crises that are interlinked, the climate crisis, the biodiversity and nature crisis and the pollution and waste crisis. Now there's 8 million premature deaths from air pollution every year um, in the world. A lot of that obviously from vehicular emissions. And we heard about the Euro 4 standard, uh, which was introduced back in 2006. I would like to remind you, Euro 5 in 2009, Euro 6 in 2014, and we're looking for Euro 7 in 2025 or thereabouts. But anyway, that standard, Euro 4, did introduce an 80 to 90% cleaner vehicles than the older pre-year pre four uh, vehicles. So that's the important bit that we need to understand. We have clearly, there's so many benefits. We are seeing this rapidly growing sector and nearly a quarter of all energy related global greenhouse gas emissions actually are related to transport and to vehicles. So that's a very serious issue. Now, I'm not going to go into road safety because others have spoken about this. Now, what is UNEP up to? So at the end of, uh, towards the end of 2020, we launched a, a, a used vehicle program with partners. We had support for that from the UN Road Safety Fund, from FIA Foundation, and from Sweden and others. And the aim really was to support the development and the implementation of minimum criteria and standards for both importing and exporting countries. And Stendu, you have been a fantastic voice in the Netherlands. You co-launched your report at the same time as ours and in the EU. And now at the, and of course, at the global stage with the World Bank. And we really want to see uh, that we can exit these obsolete uh, aging and unsafe and polluting cars. Now, our first focus has been on Africa. That is where the situation is most urgent. And that is where we see a degree of interest, but also a degree of capacity needs uh, uh, desired. So what needs to happen now is clearly a much broader approach. We need to first think about the regulatory setting, adopting the standards, yes, but then supporting the African countries in, in ensuring that those regulations are implemented. And that's not an easy thing. We were very, very proud to work with ECOWAS on the standards and Ghana was a standard bearer here. And so ECOWAS has passed this regulations, but it's they now need to make it filter into inspection and compliance and enforcement and information exchange and all of that. But we also need, as we heard just now from Minister um, Stenji van Belthoven, that we need to have the exporters, frankly, stop exporting used vehicles that do not meet that minimum standard. And I very much like the idea of a roadworthiness uh, certificate. Uh, and it should be a global global thing, and it should be completely unacceptable to dump your unsafe and polluting vehicles. And of course, we've started in Africa, but Asia and Latin America are equally important. And we was we focused initially on light duty vehicles because that is that booming market. We all understand that we need a similar approach for heavy duty vehicles. And so later on this year, we will issue a report on trade in heavy duty, heavy duty used vehicles. So we've seen after our report launch of last year, a lot of interest. Um, and building on this, we really can help fix this issue if we get exporters and importers working together, but they need some government gov regulatory guardrails. And the, the faster we can enforce these or enable these regulatory guardrails, the better. Uh, UNEP, um, uh, the previous vice president, uh, Mark Tadiak, a dear friend, and I, we discussed how we could push this. And I'm delighted that, Pablo, you're carrying the flag now. Uh, we would very much like to see how, you know, with the World Bank investment dimension, with UNEP standard setting, engaging at the policy regulatory uh, setting based on the science that we know, how we can upscale and get others to crowd in. 
in our world, the United Nations Environment Assembly will invariably be looking at standards. Air pollution is a keen concern, and as is climate change. So we expect that there will be some regulatory dimension discussed at this point. Uh, and that should take place in the early 2022 February. So with that, let me stop here and just thank everyone very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Inger. Uh, looking forward to working with uh, colleagues uh, at UNEP uh, that played such an important role with that initial report um, last year and, and, and with the Netherlands and others in, in scaling up, as you mentioned. Let, let us now um, hear and invite um, Dr. Robert Lisinji, um, who is the Transport Director of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. He is uh, today joining us on behalf of the UNECA Executive Secretary, who is uh, Mrs. Vera Songwe, who regrettably could not join us today. But we're very lucky to, to have you today, Robert. Uh, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Excellencies, uh, ladies. Uh, and gentlemen, and I am pleased to represent Dr. Vera Songwe at this very important uh, panel. Uh, the focus of this panel on global trade of used vehicles and how countries can better manage their motor vehicle fleets to improve environmental and safety outcomes is very relevant uh, for Africa. And I will use uh, these few minutes to share some thoughts uh, here at ECA on, on the issue of used vehicle sales uh, specifically to, to Africa. Uh, I would like to narrow uh, my intervention to safety of used vehicles on the continent. Uh, in that regard, this discussion could not have come at a better time. A time when the development of road safety action plans is ongoing at the global, regional and national uh, levels in the context of the second UN road safety decade uh, 2021 to 2030. I think uh, what this means is that we can mainstream safety of used vehicles in the action plans at the three levels. Uh, ECA is privileged uh, to be closely involved at all these levels and is ensuring that the safety of vehicles future prominently in the different uh, action plan. Personally, uh, I've been honored to be part of uh, the global task force that is uh, developing the global uh, action plan and also spearheading working closely with uh, the African Union Commission, the, the African action plan for the decade 2021-2030. Uh, I think that the problem with the safety of vehicles in Africa is related to three different things. First is the age. Uh, we do know that the average age uh, of vehicles in many African countries is more than uh, 20 years old. That's a relatively old uh, fleet. Uh, the other issue is poor maintenance of vehicles, and I will come back to that, and, and the absence or lack of enforcement of high uh, vehicle standards and, and regulations. So those are the issues that we identify in terms of vehicle safety uh, in Africa. So while aiming for high standards for vehicles imported into Africa, we think uh, we must not lose sight of the, mean, the need to ensure that imported vehicles, and indeed those vehicles that are already on the continent, remain road worthy, which brings into uh, the picture the issue of uh, maintenance. That is why ECA is advocating for mandatory inspection of vehicles in all African uh, countries. So far, we, we, we know that uh, vehicle inspection is mandatory in a lot of countries on the continent, but there are still some countries uh, in Africa where vehicle inspection is not uh, mandatory. We believe that the private sector has an important role to play uh, to that end. That is why uh, we are encouraging governments to authorize private sector operation of vehicle inspection centers. Again, uh, we are encouraged that some African countries already encourage uh, or authorize the private sector to operate uh, vehicle inspection centers. We think that uh, investment uh, in, in vehicle inspection is a good example of impact investment, which means investing in vehicle safety, which is a good cause, as it is about saving lives, while at the same time generating uh, return on, on investment. 
and also uh, protecting uh, the, the, the environment. Uh, as we embark on this important agenda, we, we believe that uh, we must not decouple the discourse on sale of used vehicles from that of mobility in developing countries, especially, uh, uh, especially Africa. We know that many vehicles providing transport services in rural areas in Africa, for instance, are not roadworthy. This is partly due to the poor quality of roads in these areas. Uh, in essence, we are saying that investment in good quality roads is an incentive for investment in clean and safe vehicles and hence protection of our environment. And so if we uh, want to achieve uh, our objective of clean and safe uh, vehicles on the continent, and I think that is the whole rationale for trying to regulate the sale of uh, used vehicles, we must think about the whole issue of, of, of mobility. And we must make sure that uh, we regulate the sale of used vehicles hand in hand with the development uh, of good infrastructure in Africa countries. It doesn't make too much sense when you have very high quality vehicles, but very poor quality infrastructure. We think that the policy mix for safer and cleaner vehicles in Africa should include regulations, incentives, and advocacy. In terms of regulations, uh, this should cover not only the standards for the sale of used vehicles, but also regular inspection of, of, of vehicles. And we think that incentives should encourage the import of newer and safer vehicles, while advocacy should target governments and raise awareness of the scale of the challenge of used uh, vehicles. We are already seeing some countries uh, introducing incentives through uh, taxes, uh, encouraging uh, the import uh, of, of newer rather than older uh, And let me end by saying that uh, ECA will continue to work uh, with other partners like UNEP, WHO, UNECE to ensure that uh, the sale of used vehicles is, is regulated because after all, uh, most of the used vehicles end up in Africa. I, I thank you so much and it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Robert Lisingi, uh, for, for, for that contribution and excellent points uh, on the need for, for a holistic approach uh, where, where the issue of, of standards for, for vehicles is put in, into the context of, of improving mobility. And, and, and that involves uh, not just vehicles, but, but standards for fuels and, as you rightly point out, infrastructure, the quality of roads. So um, with that, uh, those introduction, um, we thought that we now would ask um, a series of, of quick questions to go a little bit deeper on, on some of the issues that, that have been mentioned. So uh, we would like to start uh, with uh, Minister von Stinte, I mean, sorry, Minister von Bethoven, um, apologize, Minister. Um, the question to you is, um, what can be done to get more high-income countries to take shared responsibility on this issue, to ensure that used vehicles that they export are road-worthy and, and less polluting? Uh, you, you mentioned the, this proposal of a road-worthiness uh, certificate. Um, could you elaborate on, on, on your vision for, for bringing more countries into this agenda? And over to you, Minister, and thank you. Thank you so much. And, and please excuse my, my first name. I think my parents never envisaged an international career, so I'm, I'm bothering anybody on, the, on any panel with my first name, so no, no worries. Um, we absolutely need to step up. We need to step up uh, in the developed countries. Um, if I look at, because the, the issue is, is so outlined by all of the speakers, by the way, um, it's about the coordination with the import and destination countries. It really is also about what we can do as exporting countries. Well, the Netherlands is a small part of all of the export, export which is being done uh, from Europe. Uh, countries like Germany, UK, Italy, Spain, France, we need, they need to come in and step up. Um, and I think it was 
uh, any direct reaching out to these major exporting countries, whether it's by the Secretariat of ECOWAS countries or the African Union, individual, individual countries or the stakeholders can always help, let me tell you. Uh, I would of course also do so in the context of the EU. And I think there are uh, a number of elements which are also very interesting in that sense. The European Commission has uh, last month adopted the EU action plan which is called Towards Zero Pollution for Air, Water and Soil, which is a, a key deliverable of the European Green Deal. Um, and there are two flagship initiatives under the Zero Pollution Action Plan that I think have direct relevance to the topic of today and therefore provide a good, let's say, angle for continuing the discussion in, in Europe. The first there is flagship H2, aimed to reduce the EU's external pollution footprints by restricting the export of products and wastes that have harmful impacts in third countries. So there is a direct link in the proposal of the European Commission to start discussing uh, the, the idea of a roadworthy um, uh, certificate. And second, there is the planned review of the majority of EU waste laws to adopt them to the clean and circular economy principles, because we need to ensure that cars that are exported are exported as cars, not as a way to circumvent basically waste legislation in Europe uh, and are basically not roadworthy and are actually exported for dumping. We should absolutely start to, uh, to avoid that. So uh, this year, next year, we are reviewing the EU waste shipment regulation and the end of life vehicles directive. So I think these are exactly the, the, the times when we can actually concretely discuss what we as European countries could do to, uh, to fix our part of this problem. Uh, and then of course, we need to do that in cooperation uh, with the Global South. And I think the, idea, the point of the, the management uh, and the repair and maintenance uh, in, uh, in developing countries is absolutely crucial because if you don't do that, then a good car may become a bad car or an unsafe car unless you maintain it well. So all elements of the chain are gonna be crucial. Thank you, Minister. And, and apologies again for that misstep with Oh, no, 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 no problem, no, no. <laughs> um, so, so thank you very much. So, so very concrete steps uh, to move uh, this agenda forward um, in the EU um, and, and, and hopefully then globally. Um, Mary, if I may, I'd like to turn to you. Um, thinking about this green divide that, that, that we have mentioned, that this, this trend that the emissions and the safety outcomes uh, of the vehicle fleets are improving in one part of the world in high income countries, but much less so in, in developing countries. Um, what role do you see, Mary, for uh, international financial institutions like the World Bank uh, in helping address this, this green divide? Um, thank you, Mary. Yeah, thanks, Pablo. Uh, I think what's needed is a combination of knowledge, investments, and capacity building, as well as collaboration. So by knowledge, I mean what information and analysis are missing about motor vehicles in our client countries. We need to build uh, on the good work already available from the UNEP Global Report on Used Vehicles and the Dutch Report on Used Vehicles Exported to Africa to tailor, advi to tailor the advice to our clients. I mean, both uh, these reports were already mentioned. And the framework report on motorization management for development, which will be, which will be published by the bank uh, uh, soon uh, is also another uh, step in that in that direction. You know, it is about what everybody's been saying. You know, the issue of standards, regulations on export and import side, and I would think the role of carbon taxes. On investments, uh, there is a need to fund. There is need of obviously uh, to fund the basic infrastructure, equipment, and programs of motorization management. And this means uh, vehicle inspection and enforcement programs, IT systems to register vehicles, support for professionalization, the repair and maintenance industries, end of life vehicle disposal programs, and so on. And we also want to accelerate the vehicle fleet turnover. So how do you replace the obsolete inefficient vehicles with cleaner and safe, safer ones? And this means buying down the residual value of the obsolete assets being used. And we need to ask the question, if we want to scale this up and have meaningful impact on climate challenge, uh, we will need substantial resources. By capacity, I mean how prepared are countries to formulate these policies around motor vehicle registration and use, as well as the vehicle emissions and fuel standards. 
and how prepared are they to implement and adjust those policies as needed? Uh, and I think a lot of these issues are at the at the subnational level. So we, we also need to think about that. Countries uh, need to align their fiscal policies and prices with environmental objectives so that we have the right incentives uh, to consumers on vehicles and fuels. But we know that any process of adjusting prices from where they are to where they should be, uh, there can be winners and losers. And you know, we only have to think about the yellow jackets to know that uh, how difficult it is uh, to implement these policies. So we need to really uh, think about the, the just, what was uh, known as the just transition uh, that, is, that needs to be uh, in line with the, with the policies of, of decarbonization. And finally, collaboration is key. I mean, all of the previous speakers have mentioned the importance of collaboration and working together. And this can uh, uh, this is much needed if we want to have meaningful results at a global level. And we are keen to work with partners in the UN system uh, with proactive and forward-looking exporting countries like the Netherlands and with other MDBs and bilateral donors to strengthen the system of rules governing the international trade of secondhand vehicles and channel investments to strengthen both the governance and climate positive outcomes uh, of uh, improved motorization management around the world uh, with a special focus uh, on developing countries. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so, so very clear agenda of knowledge, investment, capacity building, and, and collaboration. Um, Inger, if I may, I'd like to turn, turn to you now. Um, we've mentioned uh, the importance uh, for us, uh, from our perspective, of the report that, that, that your team led last year uh, on, on the trade in used vehicles. Uh, our sense is that it, it, it is helping open many people's eyes uh, to this issue. Um, following the report, um, our question would be, how do you see the, 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 the actions that need to be taken to, to, uh, to, to, to start addressing the issue? Um, you already mentioned some ideas in this regard, if, if, if you could elaborate. Thank you, Inger. Sure, absolutely. Look, so we at UNEP, we're calling for Euro 4 as a minimum, and we're calling for eight years of age, uh, a max, right, for, vehicle, for the vehicle fleet that be imported or, if you like, exported. And so today, however, in Africa, the average age is 18 years. Let's just pause for a minute on that and the it's euro two and three so we have some stretch work to do now um and 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 if we and and i won't go into all the benefits but if we shift to euro four it's going to be childhood asthma that we put that we reduce it's going to be the well-being of our people it's going to be overall uh health in in the urban environment as well as the road safety that we heard so eloquently from Robert. So there are just lots of benefits. Now, the good thing, and I referenced uh, ECOWAS because they were the front runner, right? They've, they've made it happen. They've got a fantastic leader in the Ghanaian minister who sort of rallied um, the, the troops, so to speak, in the ECOWAS setting. But the good news is that, and they now really want to help roll out and we're helping roll out on capacity building for the standards, et cetera, but more is needed and the World Bank can do a lot in this regard. Now in conversations with uh, East African community, they've started the process, which we're very pleased about for the Euro 4, process, uh, Euro 4 standard. And we are hopeful that they will implement that before the end of 2021. So that is a really good second move. Behind that, on the, on, the, on, the, on the wind of that, we will need to again support them on capacity building for standard enforcement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, with SADC, uh, they have started the discussion for minimum standards. So that's really good. And of course, we're working with the African Union um, to see if there can be sort of a harmonized approach across. But, but we do have to recognize that across the continent, uh, we really see a variety of, of, of regulations and that doesn't help the importers or the exporters. Um, some have complete bans, some have age restrictions, some has fiscal incentives, some have labeling requirements, and this doesn't make the market any easier. But I mean, Morocco uh, put uh, a stricter standard, five years max, right? And only Euro 4 vehicles. 
And before you know it, it begins to become competitive to import secondhand electric vehicle and hybrid vehicles. And that's really interesting. So if you can, I mean, you can help the market shift into something cleaner and greener. Outside the African continent, it's worthwhile to just stopping for a moment and reflecting on Sri Lanka, where 50% today of all the petroleum-based vehicles are actually hybrid. It's unbelievable. It's the highest number in the world, but they've sort of taken that goal and just run with it. So it can be done. And uh, the more we support in this regard, the, the more we can do. So we're very, very pleased with the World Bank leaning in. And since you have, I have to say you, because I'm no longer there, uh, a strong program also on long haul and customs, etc. it would be really interesting also to deal with the heavy duty vehicles in the second round. And here, our next report might give you some um, elements to consider how the, um, the investment and the World Bank support program could come in uh, in that vehicle fleet as well. Let me stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Inger, and, and great, um, great uh, ideas and, and suggestions. Glad to hear that the East African uh, community is also moving fast, and and so 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 definitely um, we should work together on on the various steps that that you mentioned. Let me now turn to to Robert again. Um, I don't see uh, Robert uh, camera, but I, I see Robert. You are still connected, so that's great, um, Robert. Um, uh, a lot have, has been said uh, about about Africa, and 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 uh, it's not it's not a coincidence. Africa receives the largest share of exported used vehicles. It's the region, perhaps, where this agenda is most critical. No no wonder uh, a lot of the work has been focused on on Africa. Um, what you have already mentioned some of the challenges that that Africa faces, uh, but if if you take a step back. And, 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 you know, think about motorization uh, in, in Africa. Um, what do you see as, as the major challenges? And what will be the key actions that you would like to see in the continent? Uh, Robert, um, over to you. Uh, I hope your connection is still working. Thank you. I think we may, we may have a connection problem. Um, because I don't see a reaction from, from Robert. Let, let us see if our team can, can contact, uh, contact um, Robert and, um, and I'm sure he's gonna be back. So, so maybe, maybe, um, maybe we switch to, to another panelist. Um, Mary, can, can I go to you? Unless, unless Robert is back, um, maybe we go to you, Mary. Uh, so, so Mary, um, the world. Oh, I, he, I hear. Uh, okay, so, so Mary, so the World Bank, uh, like other MDBs, um, and, and as Inger was just mentioning, um, engages um, systematically with, with governments on issues related to, to transport and the environment. Um, we engage um, with ministries of transport. But increasingly, this agenda of greening transport requires engaging also with ministries of finance, as you said, uh, to, to align fiscal policy with sustainability objectives, and, and also with ministries of environment in this green uh, agenda. Uh, what do you see as, as the, the approach, the, the key points of engagement at the country level, uh, particularly on this issue of secondhand uh, vehicles and, and motorization management? Um, over to you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we need to emphasize that this agenda is both relevant and actionable so that we can have that broad engagement at the country level. In terms of re relevance, I think we need, we need to make the, the clear links between how uh, uh, fleets of substandard obsolete vehicles with poor, will lead to poor outcomes in terms of air quality, road safety performance, and greenhouse gas uh, emissions and how uh, motorization management policies and investments can in fact support climate action plans and commitments by reducing uh, fossil fuel consumption of the fleet. So they can actually be part of the country's NDCs, if you like. They can also have a wider economic, financial and fiscal benefits, such as creating new employment, modernizing industries, increasing tax revenues, and reducing uh, operational costs. So you, you kind of have to have this uh, narrative for the policymaker 
so that they will uh, see the, the benefits uh, and the relevance. Uh, and in terms of making it actionable, uh, first, you want to make the motorization management an integral part of our lending and dialogue with client countries. This is from a, a bank perspective, obviously. Uh, and just like uh, we discuss many things, uh, we should uh, also be discussing motor vehicle stock management as part of the transportation sector uh, development issues that we talk about. And again, uh, you know, we are designing these uh, new diagnostic tools for climate uh, called climate change uh, and development reports, which will feed into the strategic uh, country dialogue. So I see this uh, again, just this specific issue could become a part of, of our discussion. Uh, and, and we also uh, need to uh, strengthen our own staff's uh, knowledge on, this, on the topic so they can better channel resources to help our client countries. Second, we can point to studies that inform investment programs. For example, the bank partners has partnered uh, with, with, uh, with various partners to develop a program for the assessment of vehicle inspection systems called Avis, like the rental car Avis, <laughs> which we are carrying out in nine countries in four regions, uh, Armenia, Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Ecuador, Philippines, Niger, Nigeria, and Togo. So it's a range of small and big countries. So I think it's a good sample. And this has actually led to a regional development project under uh, preparation in Burkina Faso, Niger, and, and Togo uh, to implement vehicle inspection and truck truck fleet renewal measures. So these can be replicated uh, in other countries. Finally, working with partners to support the global facility for decarbonizing transport will also be key uh, because it will fund the upstream studies, uh, you know, the, the what, what to do and how to do it uh, question uh, and provide the technical assistance and the design the solutions for our client countries. Because I, I think this is really uh, and, and learn, you know, cross-country learnings uh, is, is very important. And that's one of the, I guess, unique advantage uh, of the bank. So we hope that we can really uh, work towards uh, not just uh, emphasizing the relevance, but also helping client countries to, to go to, towards investment and action. Mary, thank you very much. And I'd like to apologize to you and, and to our panelists. Uh, we have been... Um, very thorough and, and we have gone a little bit over time. Um, uh, if, if, if possible, for those who, who do not have to jump to another meeting, I'd like to, to, to take the opportunity to maybe ask uh, Robert for a few last words and also M Minister uh, uh, Beethoven for, for a few last words. And, and then we will move to the second part of this, of this event. Um, so, so Robert, um, any, any thoughts on, on what do you see at the as the main challenges for, for Africa? And, and can you see the model of ECOWAS being replicated um, elsewhere in the continent? Um, over to you, Robert. Um, briefly, um, if, if possible, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry, I've been having some connection there. Uh, uh, problem, well. but I, I think that uh, one of the biggest challenges in Africa is uh, we have uh, policies at, at the regional level uh, that we have put together. For instance, we have worked with the African Union uh, Commission, so we have strategic directions uh, uh, for for road safety 2021 20, uh, to 2030, and we have a very clear policy mix uh, in relation to. Uh, to, to use the vehicles. The one is uh, the, the related to, to, to regulations. Uh, we do believe that African countries, uh, to the extent possible, uh, should, should join and sign the UN conventions uh, on vehicles uh, standards. That is one. Uh, number two, uh, I did mention uh, that they do need to have mandatory vehicle uh, inspection. Because it's one thing to bring vehicles that are roadworthy to the continent. It's another thing to make sure that those vehicles remain uh, road, uh, road, 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 road worthy. I think also uh, there's the issue of incentives uh, to bring in new uh, vehicles uh, on the on the continent. Some countries do have age limits that they impose uh, for the importation of vehicles. Others introduce uh, in terms of incentives in terms of uh, lower 
uh, taxes uh, for newer and cleaner vehicles. So we do have these uh, policies at the continental level. The challenge we are having is to bridge that gap between policies at the regional level and at the national level where implementation should take place. And we believe that uh, enforcement uh, becomes uh, very, very uh, important there because even in some countries where you do have uh, uh, regulations, standards in place, enforcement is not uh, very strong. Uh, and so we think we need to advocate uh, for, 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 for these measures to be implemented using all the, the platforms that we have. And that's why the ECA is working very closely with uh, the UN Special uh, Envoy for, for Road Safety, Jean Todt, uh, to the extent possible, to, to use his voice uh, to, to, to encourage uh, countries to implement these measures that we know that they work. I think uh, just to emphasize again that we like to look at uh, the, the issue of used vehicles in a holistic uh, uh, manner uh, in terms of mobility. We know that mobility is a big challenge in Africa, in urban areas, but also in uh, rural uh, areas where most vehicles there, frankly, are not roadworthy. So there's a dilemma uh, for policy makers. Do you take all of these vehicles off the road because they are not roadworthy? What do you then do uh, with the mobility of, 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 of these people? So as we tackle this issue, of, of vehicles that are not safe, that impact on our environment, uh, we should also look at the issue of uh, mobility of our populations in cities, in, in rural uh, areas. So I would just like to, 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 to end there, uh, to, to say that uh, it's something that we need to look at in a holistic manner, and it involves a lot of uh, advocacy uh, from all quarters. Uh, also, I'd just like to say that we we want to see a harmonized uh, standards uh, for the sale of used vehicles in in Africa. We like what is happening uh, with UNEP championing in ECOWAS ESC. In fact, we are part of uh, the the UNEP uh, led uh, project on cleaner and safer vehicle. We do like to see a situation where the standards are harmonized uh, at the continental. Uh, uh, level. So I will just I will just leave you on that on that note. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Excellent points, uh, Minister Beethoven. Uh, any any final words on on let's say the end game uh, for this year at COP twenty six? Thank you. Well, I say there are no final words for now because there's so much work to be done. Um, but I think that what Robert outlined only on the one hand, increases the importance, but also the challenge that we're facing. Because non-mobility is not an option, but neither is unsafe mobility. Uh, and so we need to ensure that we indeed look at how do we make mobility possible in a safe uh, way, uh, road safety, but also environmentally health safety. Uh, of course, uh, uh, spatial planning, uh, electric mobility, electric bikes, scooters, etc., not just cars, public transport, I think all of these, uh, these topics are going to be discussed in the, in the future TDI series. So uh, I think a great agenda for all of us. And I hope that all those investment series too will lead to recommendations that we can then take to the COP. There is an urgent need to make progress, but there's also a willingness to make progress. There is so much that we can solve together. If we do things smarter uh, and we can do that by working together. So me, for me, I'm very much looking forward to continuing our cooperation and hope to meet you all at the COP. Thank you, Minister. Thank you so much for your support to this agenda. Thank you, Inger. Um, we heard you on, on, on working on, on standards at, at the UN. Uh, and thank you, Robert, uh, so much for, for today's participation. Um, we will move to thank you and, 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 and goodbye, Minister and, and Inger and, and Robert. Uh, we will now move to the second part of this event. Um, we, uh, we have uh, Biniam Breja who will, um, will um, moderate uh, this uh, second, more technical part of the event. Over to you, uh, Biniam. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you, Pablo. That was really an excellent panel, high level panel discussion. We have quite a lot. Uh, we learned a lot and many ideas that were generated there. So good morning, everyone, again. Good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to be 
welcoming you to this technical roundtable and to moderate the session. My name is Bini Amreja. I'm the Acting Global Director for Transport in the Infrastructure Practice Group of the World, for the World Bank. We are delighted to launch this Transport Decarbonization Investment Series with, government, with the Government of Netherlands and the World Resource Institute and to co-host with the UN Environment, the inaugural TDI session on motorization management and the trade of used vehicles. We expect to continue this series on route to COP26. We'll have another five of a similar things. We have identified additional topics that are really critical to unlocking investment and collective action to decarbonize the transport sector. Uh, this include decarbonizing cities with better public transport, electric mobility with focus on expanding charging facilities, active transport, walking and cycling, green and efficient logistics system, and final, finally uh, financing the decarbonization effort that we're talking about. In the second part of the session on motorization management and the trade of used vehicles, we'll go deeper into technical aspects of this important topic, especially focusing what are the investments that are needed to, be, to improve motorization management in developing countries and to decouple the need to motor, motorize and to meet mobility demand from climate change. We heard from Robert and others in the, in, in the previous panel that we do need to ensure mobility is provided, but at the same time, we need to decarbonize that. So as developing countries continue economic growth, we know that mobility demand is going to increase. So the question is, how do we meet that demand in green and sustainable manner? During the session, we're going to discuss how we'll how we will overcome the emerging green divide in mobility where, where that we discussed in the previous panel where the global north continues to decarbonize and the south may be left with substandard vehicles to meet its mobility demand. To this end, we think collective action to promote investment in this field and address policy issues on both importing and exporting countries are needed. Today, I'm re we are really, really lucky to have fantastic panel to, to go through all these technical issues to discuss. To start with, we'll hear from our regional infrastructure director, Ricardo Pulte. He oversees and manages the infrastructure business for the Africa region that includes transport, energy, digital development, and uh, infrastructure finance and PPPs. So, the, so welcome uh, uh, Ricardo, and he will give the opening remarks. Then we'll have a presentation uh, from my colleagues, uh, Roger, uh, George and Roger. They will make the keynote presentation based on the discussion paper that we've written, Motorization Management and Trade of Used Car Vehicles. George Dorito, he's a global lead for urban mobility, and Roger Gorham is a senior transport economist, was at the World Bank. We will then have five discussions. Uh, first is uh, Marietta from the Netherlands government, uh, and, and, and then Robbie Jong, and then we have also um, Edward, and then uh, Daniel and Karim. I will introduce them as they come to speak. So for now, let me hand it over for the opening remark uh, to Ricardo. Ricardo, over to you to give the opening remark, please. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, colleagues. I, I have to say I had the luck to uh, attend the, the first part of this uh, event. And uh, I have to say congratulations, dear Ben and Pablo and all colleagues, because it was extremely interesting. I have to say uh, there are three main uh, challenges in front of us in terms of transport. And they are CO2 emissions, as we know very well that uh, transport and road in particular have a big impact on CO2 emissions. Air pollution, because obviously uh, the, we see more and more uh, cities becoming bigger. Uh, urbanizing population is very, very common all over, all over the world, not only in, uh, in uh, low middle income countries. And last but not least, but close to us, road safety. Of course, we acknowledge that road safety is not only a matter of vehicles, it's a matter also of infrastructure, but vehicles do play an important part. 
And it is not incidental, I have to say, that in the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, number 11.2 and number 3.6, they talk about access to transportation, which is universal, safe, affordable, sustainable, but they also talk about reducing global deaths and injuries that happen due to traffic. So I think we have a monumental work in front of us. In addition, motorization is, is key to economic growth. I think it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be fair to, to say otherwise. Uh, motorization is key to economic growth and it's key to job creation in low middle income countries. So it is really uh, something that must be developed, but it must be developed in the best possible way from the viewpoint of being safe, affordable and sustainable. It very much remind me the, how um, electricity is also in a very, very similar situation. Uh, of course, motorization rates are, are low in many low middle income countries, but they're growing very fast. So we can see that they will pick up very, very soon. It is especially the case in sub-Saharan Africa, the part of the world where I'm so lucky to work, I have to say. And uh, I mean, I saw in the studies and the report that around 75% of, import, of imported vehicles in sub-Saharan Africa are used. That's very much of, a, of an important point because it's really what come out from the, from the conversation. In addition, I saw another interesting statistic that in terms of uh, vehicle killing potential, also called VKP, VKP uh, regrettably in terms of countries, 17 out of 20 countries in, the, in these uh, terrible statistics are sub-Saharan. And um, I very much work and try to help sub-Saharan Africa as much as possible. I have to say I liked the, the discussion paper prepared by our colleagues. I think it's, it was really well done. And I like the point about sharing responsibility. <laughs> it is not only a matter of uh, giving all the, all the work to uh, developing countries in order to make sure that, that uh, vehicles and are, are the proper standard. I think it is the, the responsibility of exporting countries as well to make sure that what is exported is of the best possible standard. I think it would be, it would be quite unfair uh, to put all the weight on the importing countries. And by the way, I'm a big believer in inclusiveness. So if you put it only on one, well, it, well, it becomes very, very difficult. And it's also a matter of equity, I have to say. What we are witnessing now, uh, especially in the high income countries, we are seeing much more concern about climate change, which I think is very welcome. Uh, and in terms of vehicle fleet, we are seeing, I would say, a, an important swi uh, switch towards uh, electric cars. It's not a huge acceleration, but it is an acceleration nevertheless. So, and I'm very happy about that. What I would be far less happy is that having more and more electric cars in uh, high income countries would uh, translate in seeing, in seeing uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, internal combustion vehicle in, uh, in uh, low and middle, middle income countries. I have to say there must be a way not to shift the, the responsibility or the, the weight of uh, emissions, of uh, accidents, of air, of air quality towards other countries. So I very much liked the, what is written in the document. And actually I liked very much what was said during the, the meeting that was chaired by Pablo a few, a few minutes ago. I like the idea of motorization management. Uh, I can see, I would like to see it quicker, to happen quicker, but I think that's a little bit of my uh, personality. But I have to say, I have to say it's important to see what vehicles are imported and exported both ways. Technical inspections, maintenance. I'm, I'm not going to talk about road now, but that part of the equation as well. And the end of life status, which is not only about the vehicles, but also about components and think about lead batteries and the way they are, <laughs> they are um, put out of, of, of life and, and the way they are stored. It's, it's a huge vehicle for pollution. So I have to say, of course, roads, fuel, vehicles, our part of the same equation. So I think, I really hope that we can accelerate on implementing, I heard very good, um, very good comments about the, uh, the plan, the policy, the plan, the program we have in uh, with ECOWAS, 
but I would like to, to see it more practical and to be implemented as, as much as possible. My last word is it is important not to leave anybody behind. It's very important to be inclusive because there will be, of course, comments about uh, affordability. How can we have a job creation and economic transition without these vehicles at an affordable price? I think it's an important point. And it's a point to be taken into account because it is, I liked, for example, the comment made by Mary about uh, yellow vests and what happened when some kind of legislative uh, changes were done without proper consultations. So that's what I would say. It's very important. This is a key initiative. Congratulations to all of my friends and colleagues. And I have to say, let's make sure we can implement it and make sure we are as inclusive as, as possible. And, and a big thank you to all of you colleagues. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ricardo. We hear you. We have to accelerate this initiative uh, and we have to be practical and we have to be inclusive and really take into account the political economy of this reform that we're embarking on. Uh, very, very good points, uh, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're gonna move to the keynote presentation. So first, I think I have to apologize to everyone that we are late in this session. We're starting late. So we may have to extend it uh, by a few minutes, okay? So hopefully we will try to make up the time. So the keynote presentation is going to be given by George Dorito and uh, Roger Goran, both of whom led the discussion paper that uh, is being presented today and is the basis for our uh, discussion, both for the high level panel and for the technical round table. So, George, uh, over to you and Roger, uh, however you guys decided to coordinate. Okay, back to you. Thank, thank you, Ben, and, and thank you, Ricardo. Uh, so my name is George Darido, and together with Roger Gorham, we'll be presenting. Uh, Roger, if you could project the slides. Uh, so as we've heard already, uh, this agenda has two parts, managing rapid motorization, especially in the developing world and the global trade of used vehicles. And this is a critical agenda because decarbonizing road transport is essential to building a low carbon future. So as you'll hear in this presentation, solving this global challenge will require cooperation among countries, international agreements, and greater investments in developing countries. So before we get started, I also wanna say that there's a lot of excitement about the future of electric vehicles, but this revolution will impact developed and developing countries differently, and not necessarily in a favorable way uh, to decarbonization if we're not deliberate about it. Next slide, please. So I want to start, uh, by pointing out the striking difference in the relative growth of transport related greenhouse gas emissions between the developed and the and developed developing countries. So this graph is using the year 2000 as a baseline and OECD countries as a proxy for developed countries. The, the growth from OECD countries has largely leveled off in the past two decades, despite continued growth in GDP and vehicle kilometers traveled. Meanwhile, emissions have more than doubled since 2000 in developing countries, and this will continue. There are many forces at work here, but the two that we'll focus on today are increasing motorization in the developing world and improvements to vehicle stocks, technologies, and standards in the developed world. So two important points to clarify here uh, in this graph. The transport carbon footprint of developed countries is still much higher than that of developing countries, both in absolute terms and on a per capita basis. This is because there are many times more motor vehicles per capita in the developed world. A comprehensive approach to decarbonize transport includes not only improving the performance of vehicles, but also avoiding unnecessary motorized trips and shifting motorized trips to more sustainable modes. So this broader decarbonization strategy will be the focus of future events as we've heard. So please stay tuned. Next slide, please. 
So if we look at projected growth of vehicles over the next several decades, we see that the developing world is starting to catch up. Most of the projected growth in motor vehicles will be in developing countries from about the middle of this decade through 2050. Some of this growth will come from electric vehicles, but much of it will be met by conventional fossil fuel vehicles. Even under the most optimistic scenarios for electrification of new vehicles, it is likely that more than 2 billion new internal combustion engine vehicles will be sold over the next 30 years. And all of this will occur during a period when the, the number of vehicles in the developed world will remain pretty much flat, as the graph shows. The hope is that fossil fuel vehicles of today will be replaced by electric vehicles tomorrow. But this also begs the question, where will all those fossil fuel vehicles go? Next slide. So based on current trends, the answer to that question is likely to be the developing world, as we've heard. This picture is uh, from the 2020 UNEP report uh, showing major trade flows of used vehicles in the world. To meet the growing demand for affordable motorized transport, low and middle income countries rely heavily on importing used vehicles from high income countries. And, and also based on this UNEP data, we estimated that for over 50 developing countries, more than three quarters of their vehicle imports are used. Next slide. Before we go further, um, let's also be clear that there are many positives associated with the global used car trade. Some of them will have already been mentioned. First, that they are, provide, uh, used vehicles provide an affordable option for mobility. They do open up access to opportunities. They support millions of jobs and economic development. They can be safer and less polluting than vehicles currently being used in, in a particular country. And if they're properly maintained, they can also have superior performance than even first use vehicles built for poorly regulated markets. But there can also be many challenges, particularly in the developing world. Uh, first, the safety and emissions technology uh, in these vehicles may be broken or obsolete or removed entirely. Uh, they may be structurally unsound and their maintenance or accident history may be unknown. Sometimes uh, the appropriate fuels and spare parts are not available or the mechanics are not trained. And finally, the CO2 emissions are underreported in global models. So to conclude my part uh, of the presentation, I want to emphasize here that the problem is unmanaged motorization combined with poor quality used vehicles being traded on the world market. This is what contributes to the green divide that we heard earlier, uh, meaning the, the externalities from the road transport sector diverging uh, trends between the developed and the developing world, which you see pictured here. So in terms of CO2 emissions from transport, in terms of air pollution, which leads to premature deaths and traffic tra deaths and injuries. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Roger, to describe the potential solutions. Roger. Thanks, George. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so I just want to uh, emphasize that a key message of the discussion paper uh, and this more detailed report that we'll publish later this year is that developing and primarily importing countries need to move beyond the ad hoc responses uh, to various challenges of rapid motorization. And what is near, needed is the coherent approach, which we call motorization management. One second. Motorization management refers to deliberate, diligent, and coordinated efforts to shape the way motor vehicles are managed throughout their effective life in a given country in order to improve safety, environmental, and fuel consumption outcomes. Note that motorization management, by definition, is looking to use common processes around governing motor vehicles to address multiple goals related to sustainable transport, safety, pollution, efficiency, climate change, etc. So what do we need, mean by motorization management? So here we see what we consider to be the core elements of that, that program. And let's go through them. Uh, starting at the, at the top, you'll see policy process and we really mean policy process. We tend to want to launch right into policies themselves, but we want to emphasize that for motorization management, the process itself is critical for two reasons. 
First, uh, the complexity of managing motor vehicles involves both synergies and trade-offs among objectives. So things like uh, reduced fuel intensity, reduced pollution emissions, improved fuel safety, which we've been hearing about. There's many measures that can, can improve all of these at the same time. Sometimes there may be some trade-offs that are involved. But there's other uh, public policy objectives as well, like uh, maintaining uh, the security of uh, a revenue source, the sustainability of revenue sources, or managing public investments. So uh, a public policy process allows you to manage these synergies and trade-offs in a structured way. And second, a well-organized policy process not only can help you get stakeholder buy-in, but it can also be an important tool to the general public uh, as a communication tool. So the general public is not later surprised by policy or process changes. Next, we have analytics. Uh, a motorization management program needs to be built and grounded on strong analytics. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna say much here, uh, but it, it, other than that, what this means is having an ecosystem that makes data available to analysts and makes the analytics available to the policymakers. So we've talked a lot in this uh, in the in the high level panel and also in the in this session about standards and targets. So uh, clearly, an important part of motorization management is establishing vehicle and fuel standards and targets, uh, which is often the first thing that people think of when they ask how do you improve vehicles in a country. Um, in our framework. Uh, standards and targets are indeed important, but it's not the only component of the program. Uh, I think it's worth highlighting though, uh, that standards um, uh, in the context of a system of global trade in used vehicles uh, actually can send a powerful message to importers, exporters, governments of exporting countries about what kinds of vehicle and fuel specifications are being sought and when. So all of this uh, standards, uh, standards and targets uh, are most effective uh, if there's actually an effective institutional structure of systems and programs uh, that can ensure compliance by the government, uh, compliance, compliance uh, measures from the government side, but also ensure that the industry up and down the automotive supply chain can perform up to the standards. Uh, and we call this the nuts and bolts of motorization management. So it's worth discussing in a little bit more detail. Uh, we, we argue that there is a need to systematically assess countries administrative infrastructure to be able to manage motor vehicle stocks as part of the development agenda. Uh, and this can be approached by actually breaking, breaking this down, uh, uh, breaking the systems and programs down by stage of the vehicle's life. When it enters the national stock, either through manufacture or import, uh, during its active use, and when it exits from the active use. So uh, there's a whole range of, of very specific programs that can do this and need to be assessed. All of this uh, underlined through the uh, Motor Vehicle Information Management System. Um, um, uh, I don't really have time to delve into the details, but the discussion papers uh, talks in more substance about them. And finally, we think that motorization management needs to have a specific focus on how to use market mechanisms to support key objectives and notably uh, incentivizing the renewal of the vehicle stock, which has been noted is not happening fast enough in many developing countries to meet climate objectives. Again, not enough time in this presentation to talk about, uh, to, to go into details, but a key takeaway is that stock renewal needs to be approached systematically. Uh, and again, more details are in the discussion paper. So this very quickly is sort of the, the, the key elements that we see of, a, of, a, of an effective motorization management program uh, really targeted to the importing countries. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion that this is a shared responsibility. So what do we see as the main responsibilities of the international community, the exporters uh, and the, um, the high income countries? So we really see two um, broad buckets of, of interventions. One is to strengthen international used vehicles trade frameworks and the, and the second is supporting 
uh, developing countries with financial resources and technical assistance. So let me quickly go through these 10 uh, more specific recommendations that are in the pay, uh, paper. So the first, as we've heard uh, uh, from in the high level panel, setting rules for acceptable export and import practices. Uh, and this can happen through various fora, fora and uh, the uh, very enthusiastic participation of advanced countries like the Netherlands. Uh, and that is if a vehicle does not pass periodic technical inspection in the country of first use, should it be allowed to be exported as anything other than waste? And if it's exported as waste, then it comes under the, the Basel Convention and it would be subject to those, uh, those regulations. Second, we need to enable data sharing. Exporter countries have extensive historical data on each vehicle associated with its vehicle uh, uh, identification number. And these, uh, this information should accompany the vehicles when they're traded internationally, but often they're not. Third, we need to enhance trade accounting systems so that the trade in used vehicles can be tracked as easily as the trade in new vehicles, uh, which is currently not the case. And I'm sure Rob De Jong and his team can tell us uh, in more detail about how painstaking it is to reproduce this information. Fourth, Aligning vehicle and fuel standards so that regional blocks and countries create harmonized markets, which as we've heard was uh, done last year by the 15 uh, Economic Commission of West African States. Um, and that has been uh, really quite a welcome development. Fifth, strengthening the protocols for materials recovery. recovery. Worldwide efforts to strengthen the circular economy in the automotive industry need to be extended to incorporate the reality that many vehicles end their life in developing countries. Six, assisting with diagnostic studies. Uh, we heard uh, Mary make reference to the uh, assessment of vehicle inspection systems that the, the World Bank has developed in cooperation with the uh, International Committee on Motor Vehicle Inspection. Uh, there's other kinds of di diagnostics that, that can and should be carried out and other parts of motorization management systems that equally require this type of diagnostic work. Second, seventh, support establishing regional motorization management observatories whose function would be to aggregate data and ensure appropriate analysis of regional trends. So this would help to carry out the analytics that I mentioned earlier as a key component of motorization management. Eighth, support training and capacity development. Countries and regions are putting together motorization management programs, for example, in ECOWAS, but staff is gonna to have to take on new functions and they will need to be capacitated in order to be able to do that. Ninth, the international development community needs to be ready to provide technical assistance, not only for policy development, but also designing effective implementation instruments. And last, but certainly not least, we, the international community needs to help with funding and financing. As part of ODA, official development assistance, but also to help channel private finance. So the discussion paper identifies three key funding needs from the decarbonization perspective. The first of these is funding the systems and programs of motorization management. So this is a table from the, from the paper. You can look at it in more detail, uh, but we anticipated investment programs could range from 60 to $160 million, depending on the, the, the starting point of the country and the size of the motor vehicle stock and the ambition of the program. Uh, but the, the point here is that there's an awful lot to do. Um, and um, uh, we should also recognize that many of these investments could be financed from the private sector, and or funded through user fees. But either way, the public sector really will need to take the lead on, on, on this. So the economic returns of these programs as a package clearly justify the public investments. The second key need uh, that we've identified is, I think Mary also made reference to it in her comments, was funding the economic adjustment from the aligning of pricing and public policy uh, objectives. Uh, this is really about compensating some losses that may result from better alignment uh, of the policies. And finally, um, funding and financing programs to incentivize fleet turnover. For example, by buying down residual value of assets affected by policies, limiting their use because of uh, climate reasons. 
which I had alluded to earlier. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's the presentation. I uh, apologize if we have had to go very quickly over some topics or if there's things you wanted to hear in more detail. Um, if you have specific questions, uh, do please raise them in the chat and we might be able to get to them. And I would encourage everyone to, to take a look at the discussion paper and, and participate in the participate in the, in the longer term uh, dialogue in, through this TDI series. So George and I look forward to hearing your comments, uh, hearing the comments of our panel members and then a lively discussion uh, from everybody participating. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you, Roger. Thank you, George, uh, for really laying out the issues very clearly and for also coming up with some concrete recommendations that are really excellent. So now we will go into the discussion session and we have identified five excellent discussions that are going to give us some ideas for they will discuss from their point of view. And then at the end, we will also have a closing remark uh, by Herman from the Netherlands. So first, um, let me invite uh, Marietta uh, Harjono. Uh, Marietta is a coordinating specialist for the Netherlands Human Environment and Transport Inspectorate um, ministry, uh, in the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. She led the project on reviewing the quality of used vehicles exported to African countries, which was actually mentioned in the high level panel. And uh, so Marietta, why don't you also give us a brief uh, remark about uh, your views on what you heard from George uh, and uh, uh, Roger. And also, you know, there are many issues that have been raised already uh, in, this, uh, in this forum mm -hmm. and previously. But also, what are your views? What do we need to do more to have like greater impact, if you will, on this agenda? Okay, Marietta, over to you. Thank you. But thank you so much, Ben, and hello, everyone. I realize it's been a long sit for everyone in the audience. So let me see what I can add. And I already apologize if I repeat proposals that we've heard already from others today. Um, but first, let me say that I'm, I'm very, I feel very strong about this topic and I've been working on this passionately. So I truly hope we can advance this, this topic and I'm really excited to work together with the World Bank and UNEP and WRI on this topic. Um, well, as some of, of you in the audience may recall, uh, last year we published this report. It was mentioned uh, by Inger. Um, from UNEP. Uh, we republished this together with, uh, with UNEP uh, last year. And the study very, very quickly made clear um, that many of these vehicles that are exported from the Netherlands, but the quality is quite indicative for what Europe actually exports, is that the vehicles are very old. Um, most of the time they do not have a valid roadworthiness certificate. Uh, the emission systems uh, many times uh, do not work and they have a very high mileage. And if you compare, we compare them with the vehicles that end up at the recycling yard in the Netherlands, many times actually they are quite comparable. Um, and since we, we published this, this, this study and the and attention was raised to this topic, uh, I witnessed actually three things. Um, well, first of all, I think it opened the eyes of many, which, which is very good, of course. And also, I think we also started to realize that if we take decisive and joint action, there will be a lot of benefits for, for climate, human health and road worthiness uh, and road safety. So, that, so that's very good. And lastly, I think it becomes clearer and clearer what is the kind of action we need. And we are also heard, and I want to uh, applaud George and Roger for their, for their presentation. I think many of the proposals were quite good proposals in their in their presentation. So let me highlight a few of the proposals that I've heard today since we started the, the webinar. Um, there are four. Um, first of all, the import standards. And if I look back at the study that we did, we found, we observed that the better quality and younger vehicles were exported to countries like Ghana and Morocco. And these are both countries with import policies uh, to promote a cleaner vehicle fleet. 
And I'm very much looking forward to hear the views from the speakers of Ghana and Uganda in a moment. Uh, they were one of the first countries in the continent to adopt standards on clean fuels. And already mentioned many times today, the ECOWAS countries showed leadership by agreeing to uh, to require a minimum Euro 4 standards for vehicles. So putting standards in place uh, to modernize fleets and combat air pollution um, is actually very key. It makes a big difference if the import countries have policies in place and preferably harmonized uh, standards, as we know that it's the, e the vehicles easily cross uh, borders. And secondly, uh, there is this joint responsibility. It was mentioned already, already before, but I think we are at the moment that we definitely need to build a coalition. Um, and export countries need to step up. That's what I believe. And our desk study and field inspections showed that many vehicles enter the export markets, markets to Africa once they are no longer roadworthy or need repairs. And I think this is an undesirable situation because in this situation, African countries will not be able to leapfrog and benefit from the technical advancements. So as we heard from our minister, the Netherlands is in favor of, re, of, of a recently approved valid roadworthiness certificate as a requirement for exporting used vehicles outside of the European Union. And I believe that if all export countries would make this standard a reality, it would have tremendous positive effects um, on the quality of used vehicles exported. We would no longer see that vehicles for the mere reason that they are no longer roadworthy get exported. And um, we, if we indeed manage to get those standards in place, we would no longer witness that actually emission devices have been removed from export vehicles or that emission uh, devices are non-functioning. And I think what was mentioned by our minister, this is completely in line uh, with the ambitions of the European Union, if we, if we talk about the zero uh, pollution action plan. I won't go into that anymore. Um, my third point is about enforcement. So while I earlier said that regulation works, and that was made very clear from our study, at the same time, we need to be aware of loopholes. There's a lot of trade in, in second-hand vehicles and they easily cross borders. And um, our study identified several loopholes. And I think it, it therefore very important to invest in capacity building and training of inspectors to enforce standards and new standards in low and middle income countries. And perhaps start with the ECOWAS countries, I don't know. But I, I think it could have very positive effects on both the short and the middle term. Um, it will not only help that export imports are in line with the standards, but it would also, I believe, lay the ground um, for developing motorization management systems. And motorization management systems, as we've heard from the, the presentation, is a critical element for when vehicles are on the road. A younger and well-maintained vehicles, as, as we've heard, they are they are much more energy efficient, which is also good from the driver's perspective, of course. So my last point is about the end of life phase of the vehicle. And perhaps, I mean, it's already mentioned by our minister, but it's perhaps one of the more difficult uh, proposals that, that, that we need to think about how to best deal with it. But I think in any case, it would be very important to get the, the private sector to take part in a solution and involve somehow the car makers. So we already said like in the European Union, the car makers have a re responsibility for high recycling rates for when vehicles come at the end of their lives. Um, this is good, but only it, it, it only applies if they end their lives in Europe. And um, and we know that many of the vehicles actually, and uh, they are exported when they are very close to their, their end of life. Um, so that's why they fall outside the regime. Um, so I, I think it would be very interesting to explore the international component of extended producer responsibility. So to conclude, because I'm already taking time, I believe these four pieces of the puzzle would help us to grasp the benefits and um, uh, I, would, I would hope we can also find ways to, uh, clever ways to finance these policies. Uh, well, 
thanks so much uh, for your attention. Yeah. Over to you, Ben. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marietta. Those are excellent uh, comments. So now we're going to move to Rob De Jong. Uh, he, but Rob, of course, is the key author of the seminal work on used car vehicles that uh, Inger Anderson, UNIP uh, Executive Director, mentioned today. Uh, and it really is also for us in the bank that opened our eyes, literally, said, OK, well, there is this big issue that we need to work together. So we, it's been a great pleasure to uh, collaborate with UN Environment on this topic and also to co-host this really first session in the TDI series. So Rob is the head of the transport unit, right? That's, uh, so maybe then why don't you give us a little bit of uh, your thought on what you heard uh, in this regard. And also, you know, the progress that have been made in Africa in the past year, uh, and it has been yeah, good progress, but uh, what is needed really to do uh, to complete all this? and how the quality of used vehicles could be traded in Africa. And also after Africa, what are the next steps? Where do we go from here to globally? How can we make this a global undertaking? Because in to a lesser extent, East Asia, but to a more greater extent in Latin America, the same issue is also there. So over to you, Rob, uh, in this few minutes of discussion. I know you need a lot more than we're giving you, but see if you can be brief since you're so in, deeply involved in this topic. Thank you, Ben. And it's, it's really great to work with your team on this. So, so thank you also for taking the leadership in organizing this session today. Um, I'll be brief because I think Marietta just lined out exactly what needs to be done. So let me answer sort of the, the, your question, how are we going to scale this up? And I really think that we can fix this issue in the next couple of years. I really think so. If we work together at imports and exporters in the next couple of years, we can once and for all fix this issue. So we've seen excellent progress in ECOWAS and we, East African group is now also moving. So what do we need next is of course the South and North Africa group. And, and they're going to, to move in the next years. I have no doubt about that. But what is very important what everybody said, we need a harmonized approach. So I think we're now discussing with the African Union to see if we can have one approach for Africa. But of course, we also need to focus on other regions. Yes, the problems are biggest in, in Africa, but there's a massive import of used vehicles and, and poor quality used vehicles also in Asia, Southeast Asia and Latin America. And what I think is what is important is that um, we follow those three things that my executive director said um, as a global binding standard. One, we should not be exporting vehicles that don't have a valid road working certificate. Everybody said it. Second, they should be at least zero four. And third, they should meet some age requirement like eight years, like Inga said. And if we can have a global approach around these three, we could solve the issue. Now, it's nice if we, if we work in Africa and it's nice if the European Union on the great leadership of the Netherlands are taking this forward. But if the European Union will stop exporting poor quality used vehicles, maybe another country will take it over. Another market will take it over. So we really need a global approach. This is not something we can fix. We can start working bottom up at regions, but we really, in the end, need a global approach. And some people refer to the COP and some people refer to the United Nations Environment Assembly, but I really think not having this spillover effect, going, the vehicles being traded from one region to the other, I think we need that global approach. And I think there's some opportunities this year, next year, to come to that global approach. Let me stop there. I know you're, you're, you have many speakers and, and time. So let, let me just, I also want to listen to, to the African representatives. So let me stop there, Ben. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rob, for a very precise and very good comment. Okay, I know we're uh, down to hear from Daniel and Karim from Africa. But before that, there is Edward, uh, who is the head of uh, CETA, uh, a key private sector uh, stakeholder this is the International Motor Vehicles Inspection Committee. Uh, so over to you, Edward, for your intervention. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure being with you here today. Thank you for, for the invitation. And, you know, I've been taking notes during, during all the evening, and I think that very important concepts have been, uh, have been already brought to the discussion. And uh, for me, some of them, they're crucial. Uh, director, yeah. So, so we have seen that the three challenges for, for transport are, uh, are the road safety, CO2, so greenhouse effect gases and, uh, and emissions. So there are really three huge challenges, but uh, something that uh, I think it was to be mentioned here is that from a management point of view, to take care of those three aspects, from the country point of view, it's a very similar scheme. So the scheme that we can use to control that the fleet is the right one for safety is the same scheme that we can use to control that the fleet is the same for, for emissions and the same scheme for, for, for CO2. There are another very important aspects that we have heard today. So what, uh, and I want to highlight as well some of them, what can exporting countries do? I think that, uh, on top of controlling the vehicles leaving those countries to uh, for to be sold as used vehicles, they have two institutional roles very important to play. To, first one is to deliver information, to deliver data about those vehicles that are that are exporting, and the, and the second one is to help the authorities receiving those used vehicles to get the skills, to get the empowerment to control the vehicles they are receiving. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, and that has been already said today, everything is very much about enforcement. Controlling the quality of the fleet is by definition a public activity, is by definition a governmental activity. And the only way to succeed there is to be sure that the government is properly empowered to control the fit of the country and uh, has the necessary skill and resources to, to do that. A bit more focusing on CO2. CO2, it's, uh, it's a tricky question with several aspects. Uh, CO2 at the end of the day is fuel consumption. Therefore, something that may help to solve the situation is that all, every single vehicle owner are worried about, the, about his or her vehicle consumption. Something more difficult there is that we are aware that the theory and the practice and the reality of world consumption doesn't match. All of us that uh, have been driving a car, we know the difference between the theoretical values of world consumption and what we finally have to put in our vehicle in the pump. And uh, therefore it's very important to know that uh, gap, to be conscious of that gap and as much as possible to measure that gap, comparing the theoretical and the real data. And this is very important as well for additional policies that we have heard today. We have heard today that taxation may be a powerful tool to fight against decarbonization. It is actually, but we have to be careful with that. And we have some examples in that sense, even from the European Union. In the European Union, some countries, they are putting taxation benefits on plug-in electric vehicles, but at the end of the day, the user, the final user, it's not plug-in those vehicles, those, those hybrid vehicles. Therefore, the benefits that we may get from that technology, that theoretical benefit that we get uh, from the conception of the vehicle is not at the end of the day used. So we need real data to, to monitor the decisions that are taken to monitor the policies and the real data is the actual fuel consumption slash CO2 emissions. I stop here because there are many things to say. Thank you very much again for this opportunity and uh, very much looking forward to, to listening the, the, the input from Africa. Thank you, Ben. Over back to you. Right. Thank you, Edward. I think your uh, organization has been playing a key role in this agenda. So we look forward to continuing working with you. Okay. So now uh, we are going to hear from our colleagues uh, from Africa and uh, see their perspective. First is going to be Daniel Essel uh, from uh, Ghana. Uh, he's the Deputy Director for Policy uh, in the Ministry of Transport. So Daniel, uh, perhaps uh, give us your views on uh, this uh, topic uh, and what's going on in Ghana in terms of the trade of used vehicles. And also a number of people have mentioned ECOWAS 
as taking a lead in this aspect, perhaps you can also uh, discuss a little bit on that. Okay, uh, Daniel, welcome and thanks for joining us. Okay, really an honor to have you here. Um, thank you, thank you. And uh, to the colleagues, uh, thank you for, for having me here. Uh, it's an honor to also contribute uh, to the discussions. Um, I think most of them have been said by uh, the earlier speakers, but I can add a few. Um, from the discussions, uh, we have all come to the understanding that clean development initiatives that focuses on safeguarding the natural environment and protecting human lives is the way we all want to go. Having said that, it is fair to say that the future prospects of the used vehicle market depends heavily on the policy interventions and in particular, the legal regimes of exporting and importing countries alike. At the moment, uh, we are making investments in automotive assembly, in manufacturing with corresponding fiscal incentives and tax waivers for companies. Unfortunately, not everyone can afford a brand new vehicle. And therefore, they, they need for us to rethink about the future of uh, uh, vehicles as a mobility option. And from the discussions and what the experts are saying, Africa will still continue to have a big rise in the number of uh, used vehicles. And this calls for more focused action. Uh, in Ghana, we have seen more than a double of the vehicles being imported uh, from just about 100,000, about 10 years ago, we are now doing about 200,000 vehicles annually. And about 80% of these vehicles are secondhand or used vehicles and coming mainly from the EU market, from the United States of America, the Asian market, and most recently, we are getting some from the Middle East, mainly in Dubai. That notwithstanding, um, there are fiscal regimes that uh, we've used to influence the vehicles that we, we have. There are also issues with uh, the quality of vehicles that we need to deal with going forward. But key issues that we need to consider uh, going forward are the, the fiscal incentives that we can uh, deploy to attract the import of new and efficient vehicles. Uh, in Ghana, it is very expensive to import a used hybrid vehicle than a comparable ICE of same make and, and age. They are often 1.5 times higher than the, the same ICE vehicle, that's the internal combustion engines. How can we influence the fuel quality uh, we have a standard, standard of about 50 uh, ppm, but across the sub-region, there are different levels uh, going forward. So these are the questions that we need to address going forward. It is important that we also focus attention on establishing a common agenda to standardize and harmonize vehicle import regulations and standardization at the regional economic blocks within our sub-region, ECOWAS is leading an effort to introduce age-based restrictions and for standardization. Uh, for the age-based restrictions, I think now the limit is uh, having uh, Euro technology of about four, Euro, Euro standard four. In Ghana, we have implemented age-based restrictions and most recently, we introduced a law to completely ban uh, vehicles older than 10 years. Uh, we have also introduced, in terms of the testing of these vehicles, in collaboration with uh, the private sector, state-of-the-art equipment to really test the vehicles that we bring in into the system. Uh, this was to replace the manual system we used to have. Um, the idea is that we, we ensure that we conduct proper assessment on the vehicles before we certify them for road use. We also put in in place some measures to digitize all the vehicle records we have to inform accurate accounts on the vehicle stock. Despite this effort, um, the multi-dimensional nature of the vehicle market makes it very complex for achieving results without collaboration and support, especially from the international community. And, uh, and this, I meant the exporting countries. Instead of exporting the problems, as have been said by the earlier speakers, we can have a way of dealing with it, uh, enhancing local capacity to improve the quality of the used vehicles before we, we export them. Uh, I'll be brief, but moving forward, and in consideration that the conditions differ from country to country, 
it is just uh, justifiable that exporting countries jointly collaborate uh, to provide the needed support in stretching capacity for vehicle maintenance, testing, and certification regime. So, moderator, I want to conclude here. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, uh, for those good points. So now uh, we move to Karim uh, Kubuka uh, from Uganda. He's the Chief of Inspection of Vehicles. Really, I think, Karim, you're at the forefront of this business. Uh, so why don't you tell us uh, what do you see in your inspection business, especially the, the theory of uh, quality versus what you see on the real uh, on uh, on the ground. Okay, over to you, Karen. Thank you. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, I'm appreciative of the opportunity that has been given to me. I hope I'm audio. And uh, I thank you, the yes, the moderator and also the presenter of the paper, and of course the previous presenters uh, at the high level of panel. A lot of information has been said about the used vehicles, and uh, most of it actually we know it, but we just need to put it together. Uh, yes, like it has been said, uh, used vehicles here in Uganda provide a lot of business opportunities for the businessmen uh, because they are on demand. Uh, uh, because of their affordability in comparison to uh, new vehicles. And of course, he, as a result, we face a number of challenges uh, regarding the management uh, of their use, as most of them come in the country when actually they are not in good mechanical condition. Uh, yes, uh, government has introduced the policies uh, to manage uh, these vehicles uh, at, at entry, and, uh, and also in the service, uh, I'll briefly talk about some of these policies. For instance, uh, before vehicles come in the country, uh, they are inspected from their countries of origin uh, before they come to Uganda. The previous three presenters actually talked about the requirement by exporting countries to have uh, a certificate of roadworthiness before these vehicles are imported in our countries. Uh, in Uganda, we already implementing uh, that, but the problem is the monitoring and evaluation of its effectiveness because where they are inspected, we rarely uh, monitor uh, the, uh, how effective uh, the job is done. And the, uh, we have not been inspecting again at entry. Uh, when they come here, we only look at the certificate uh, of conformity given to these vehicles uh, when they are imported. So at the also entry level, we have uh, incentives. Uh, presenters, previous presenters have talked about uh, incentives uh, which can be, uh, encourage maybe uh, importation of new vehicles and also incentives which can also discourage the importation of uh, used vehicles. So we have tax levies, tax levies uh, for environmental, you can call them environmental levies. Uh, whereby vehicles which are imported in the country when they are uh, eight years and above. Of course, we have the, also the minimum, the, the, the acceptable age limit of vehicles in Uganda is 15 years so far, but then we impose the environmental levy starting from the uh, eight, eight years and above up to 15 years. So uh, th those policies are there to discourage the importation of vehicles. But now the challenge uh, with the policy of uh, tax incentives like levying uh, uh, import duty, high import duty, and also environmental tax on the uh, used vehicles, still they are not very much effective because of the low cost of the used vehicles. Because at the end of the day, however much you tax these vehicles, uh, in comparison with the newer vehicles, they still remain affordable to the public and still deal in them. So uh, the problem which the government intends to solve at the end of the day, is not well solved because the used vehicles still remain cheaper, however much you try to uh, tax them. So uh, at, we have also uh, set uh, some kind of uh, standards at, for vehicles which are in service. Uh, we have uh, regret inspection, regulations for inspection of motor vehicles. We also set uh, uh, standards uh, for vehicles, for inspection of vehicles in collaboration with the standardization board in Uganda, that is Ghana National Bureau of Authority. I'm also a member there. We develop standards uh, relating to uh, road vehicles. 
And uh, also, uh, we look at inspection, periodic inspection of vehicles. Now I'm looking at measures which are being undertaken uh, for in-service vehicles. And uh, periodic inspection of vehicles, uh, we, we introduced the mandatory requirements for vehicle inspections, contracted the company called the SGS to undertake these uh, services on behalf of the government. Uh, previous uh, presenters have talked about the PPP arrangement where you have to involve the, uh, the, 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 the private sector to do such services for you. So uh, in Uganda, we engage the, uh, a, a, a private company it's just under PP arrangement where, where uh, the, the company invested their money and the arrangement is they are supposed to, uh, to, to levy some fees, vehicle inspection fees, until uh, for recouping their investment for a given period of time. So that one we have undertaken, uh, although we still have a few administrative challenges uh, here and there for the program to be uh, fully embraced and implemented effectively uh, in U Uganda. Uh, so, uh, 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 we, we, the only issue which we are currently, I think, not doing well is managing uh, the vehicle exit, the, the exit, uh, because that is an area which is still gray, we do not have uh, standards uh, and policies. Uh, for, 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 for managing the end of life for vehicles. Uh, but he, the takeaway from the presentations which I've made and the contribution from members is this is uh, something which should be uh, taken as important as other measures to manage the uh, end of life vehicles uh, by, by, by engaging the private sector, come up with the uh, measures. Uh, in terms of uh, policies uh, to ensure that vehicles are disposed of when they reach uh, a certain uh, age or when they fail, inspection is for so many uh, uh, times. So uh, there is a, a company, of course, we are engaging some private entities uh, to undertake this on behalf of government, but we have not been having a, a clear policy direction uh, for this uh, measure, but uh, managing the end of uh, uh, life vehicle is, is critical. It is an area which uh, we are looking at critica uh, critically. Also, uh, pre previous presenters have talked about how East Africa is uh, embracing the uh, standards for motor vehicles. Yes, we are in the uh, 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 okay in collaboration with the other East African states. Uh, also working on the standard uh, where motor vehicles coming into the East African community are required to comply with the Euro 4 uh, uh, standard. So that one is on you know, the agenda, and we have already been discussing it at Uganda level, and we have sent in our, uh, our remarks at the ESC level. So this one is going to be uh, harmonized across the, 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 the region. But also, uh, the previous presenters also talked about uh, 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 promoting these standards from a wider perspective. Uh, there is a program which we have, which Uganda is involved in, also uh, under the ESC arrangement, the tripartite, uh, triple TFP. This is a program which involves the uh, three regional uh, blocks, that's the East African Community, Sadaka, and the Comesa to ensure that all standards relating to uh, motor vehicles uh, are harmonized across the uh, uh, that wider region uh, for purposes of ease of enforcement and the uh, regulation. So we are also working towards that. Of course, we have a number of challenges, uh, including the public acceptance of the standards which you introduce uh, because the, the public doesn't want to comply with the standards, in, uh, complying with the standards which are set to, means that they have to spend some money here and there, and the culture of people uh, in a, maybe in a, uh, developing countries, they don't want to spend any money. That's why most of the time they use their vehicles, which are uh, in a poor mechanical condition, the maintenance culture is so bad, and then when enforcement uh, it comes in, then the, it becomes a challenge. Sometimes the enforcement officers are also they are branded that they actually take a bribes when actually they are trying to do their work just because people do not want uh, enforcement to be carried out on their uh, vehicles. So uh, because of time, I will stop there. But uh, the, the, the initiative, as far as I'm concerned, for me, I'm appreciative. 
that we are trying to come up with the, a global harmonized approach uh, to solve the problem of uh, actually the, the, the used vehicles because the, uh, uh, the presentation has shown that there is a very steep green divide between the developing and the uh, 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 developed countries as far as the uh, greenhouse gas emission is concerned. I saw in the presentation it was very clear that in the uh, developing countries, uh, the levels uh, beyond 100, uh, towards 100 or slightly above 100 percent, whereas for developed countries, it's just below 10 percent. Uh, so really, there is need for concerted efforts because this is a global village. You cannot say because I'm living in Europe, the effects are not going to reach me. So I appreciate the efforts by the World Bank and its partners to come up with a collective approach to solve this problem. Okay, wow, wonderful. Thank you, Karim, for that very comprehensive uh, discussion. I know time is very short, uh, but you've laid out very important topics, including this harmonized approach. And I think it's great to see the East African community taking a lead on standardizing uh, uh, regulation of uh, importing vehicles. Same thing as was said in OCAS. So uh, moving forward, um, so we've extended it by a few more minutes. So we have eight more minutes left. There are a few questions that have come from the audience. So what I'll do is I'll read these questions and send it back to the panelists. And then perhaps maybe George uh, can respond to some of the questions and uh, discussions that were raised. And also the other panels, you know, Rob, Marita, Eduardo, especially what you're hearing from the Africa perspective, if you guys can also respond to that. So first let me, uh, read the questions, and then uh, we have to leave some room for the closing remark from Herman Sips, uh, who has really been leading this effort with us together uh, for a closing remarks to really highlight a few things. So uh, uh, the key questions that are coming are, do we regulate uh, uh, spare parts as well, not just only vehicles, that's one. Uh, another one is um, how we engage with other departments, uh, not just only the you know transport departments, but for setting, especially for the setting up of fuel standards. The second, uh, the third question I think was discussed quite a lot: end of life vehicle programs. How do we get started on that? And there were also a couple other questions related whether we can actually decarbonize transport for the vehicles that are already uh, old and road not worthy. And okay, so those are the questions. Perhaps you can uh, address those questions if you can, uh, together with um, uh, with others what we heard, okay? Over to you, George, briefly. Sure, Ben. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at some of these. I mean, first, I think that the the suggestions made by Rob, Marietta, and others, the need to have a certification of vehicles for export is fundamental. Uh, the, 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 the idea of limiting some vehicles by age is a little bit more tricky. I mean, I, I think that it, it makes a lot of sense because it's a very simple way to distinguish vehicles. But it is a, a bit of a blunt instrument you know, to say it's at either at eight years old or 15 years old. So th this is why I think um, the, the analysis and studies are needed to see whether that really uh, the benefits, the trade off between simplicity and, uh, and effectiveness don't really make sense. Um, I think a lot of people have already said, you know, just simply adopting Euro 4 as a standard will have many benefits across the board not just um, in terms of emissions, um, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, standards, et cetera. I, I think that it, what really is needed is to understand what is the cost implication, affordability implication, as was discussed before. On, on spare parts, uh, I think that if we know very little about the, the trade of used vehicles, I think we know even less about spare parts uh, of course, it would be essential to try to get a handle on, on everything in this, this industry and the entire supply chain. But I think the challenge is even bigger there. And end of life vehicles, I think that actually there are few countries in the world, uh, even in the, in the developed world that are doing this well. Uh, so 
this is an, a frontier area, uh, but certainly needs to be part of the holistic approach, as was mentioned before. Thank you. Great. Thank you, George. So how about Rob? Uh, maybe you can say a little bit, a few words on the cost issue that was raised, uh, price increases of quality of used vehicles, I guess kind of the inclusiveness or the equity issue, perhaps. Rob, over to you. Yes, yeah, thanks, Ben. We've done some, some research on this. And uh, I think there's some, some interesting facts. First, to recognize an old vehicle costs much more to run more fuel, more maintenance cost, et cetera. And, uh, and really, a quality used vehicle is actually over its life cheaper than a very poor quality uh, used vehicle. But we also looked at markets, markets in Mauritius, markets in Kenya, markets in Ghana, when they introduced some policies. In Kenya, they introduced a policy to restrict the age to eight years. There was a lot of uproar. People said we can't afford quality used vehicles. We want these old ones, they're cheaper. So, but that was introduced some years ago. What did we see? That were less cars imported? No. The trend just keep rising. There was no difference before or after the eight-year ban. Were these cars more expensive? Not really. So what happened? A different car was imported. A smaller car? A younger car? A cleaner car. Instead of the old 20-year-old Mercedes limousine, they went for a smaller uh, family car, much younger, cheaper to run. So studies don't always show that policies on new vehicles actually result automatically in price increases. They often show that the types of vehicles being imported shift, but the price doesn't really much in increase. We see the same in Mauritius and other examples. So it's an interesting discussion, uh, this issue, because old vehicles are not necessarily cheaper. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks, Rob. I think what you're also highlighting is it's not actually just the cost issue, but it's the, the financing structure by which cars are procured in developing countries, because many countries do not have this access to long-term financing uh, to buy vehicles. So they end up buying, it's all pay as you go. So you pay, you pay for the capital expenditure, and then you pay for the maintenance expenditure, which ends up costing you a lot. So if you can actually combine the two and get a, a, a line of credit, a financing mechanism put in place, then people can actually then purchase a, a better car than instead of paying for maintenance and operations, perhaps that money can be used for pay, payment of the loan. So this is why I think as we move towards the further decarbonization series, we're going to do quite a lot, uh, think about this financing as well. Uh, so I think we're going to run out of time, unfortunately. We have two more minutes. So I want to give that to my good colleague, Herman Sips, to give us a closing remark um, for this TDI series. Uh, I think, Herman, you, was the one, Herman, you were the one who started this TDI series. I hope you're pleased uh, with its outcome for today. And uh, let's hear your closing remark and what you see are the next steps. Herman, we don't see you. I mean, uh, can you hear? Yeah, uh, it's uh, breaking up, but uh, see if we can if we can try again. Uh, you're on uh, you're on mute maybe if you unmute can you hear me yeah now we can hear you go ahead no. please sorry ben for that glitch um and thanks for these two two closing. Yeah, but meetings. your camera is not on. If you can turn on your camera, that would be great as well. But if not, it's okay. It's on, but um, well, anyway, um, on my side it's on. I don't know why why you don't see me, but maybe that's better. Um, I'm very pleased with these two sort of closing minutes because I'm very pleased with with this day actually with this start of the TDI series. I think we we've had two fantastic panels. 
um, with a lot of energy, a lot of thoughts, and a, and a lot of good ideas. So, so that's that to begin with. What, what do I take away from this? I think, first of all, I think in, in both panels, it is very clear there is a big price to win, you know, if we accelerate on this. You know, we can avoid the green divide, we can get to the full range of benefits for health, environment, and climate. And for, uh, so, so, so that is the price to win. And I sort of sense, and it has been demonstrated by, I think, also the two last speakers in this panel, the, the second panel, but also by the high level opening panel, there is a strong political resolve to get to that price. There is African leadership, the World Bank is in, UNEP is in, there is a, a great potential in the EU to step up to the plate. So um, there is that resolve to get to the price. I think we know what it takes you know, to get to that price. We should work as a team because we need a harmonized approach. We need sort of, uh, we need sort of harmonization across fuel cars and infra standards. We need to sort of have harmonized standards across the region and we need sort of harmonization between exporters and importers. So we have to work as a team to get to that price. And we can, I think, to work as a team. We also know that we can leave no one behind. So we need to sort of focus on issues of equity and affordability. That's also a given, right? That goes without saying almost, but we should tackle them as we move along. Then obviously, you know, getting to the price means we need some fuel, right, to get there because otherwise we won't get to the price. So the issues of finance and investments are sort of crucial. And that's why we call this the Transport Decarbonization Investment Series. And I've heard a sort of few sort of things that sort of came out from that. So how do we sort of incentivize a sort of accelerated fleet renewable? renewal. So how do we go about the extended uh, producer responsibility? Should we sort of make them pay a recycling fee, an additional one, right? Sort of once sort of the, the vehicle leaves a certain region or a deposit fee or an export fee, whatever you call it. And then sort of put that in a revolving fund to finance all the things that we discussed. I've also heard Mary Pangestu sort of say, well, you know, we, we're sort of going to make this part of our lending policy. And I know from my time at the bank, that's going to be a very strong instrument. So there is a number of issues around sort of making the investment sort of work that we still need to unpack. I think we know what it takes. We are sort of now in lane, right, to get to the price. Now we have to start the engine, sort of uh, accelerate, fuel up, and then sort of go. And in that sense, what you can expect from us maybe to sort of end with, I would say stay tuned, because I think it has been said many times now, as part of this TDI series, there will be five other topics we'll cover, but there will also be a second topic, uh, a second meeting on this, um, where hopefully we'll sort of look into the investment sort of issues that we that we sort of uh, mentioned. We would very much welcome because there was a, an active sort of uh, thing going on on chat. Um, if we can sort of get your suggestions, if you've got any suggestions on innovative finance on how to scale up investments, do send them to us. Do, do look at the website to find the, uh, the connection details for that. And maybe lastly, to say, you know, as we sort of move along and whatever we do, be safe, be healthy and be green and not just on the road. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Herman, for that very good summary. I think this has been an incredible uh, panel of uh, technical experts, technical roundtable. We had many things on global agenda, uh, country level issues. Thank you, guys who joined us from Africa, Ghana, and Uganda, I think, and uh, everyone else. Uh, so this brings to a close uh, the session, but like uh, Herman said, uh, stay tuned. We, will, we appreciate your continued engagement, your continued support and participation, and we will have, uh, this is the first in the series, so we'll have uh, several of them coming up. Okay, with that, I would like to close the, the program now. Thank you, and have a good day.